Shalom, my brothers and sisters. This is El Tony coming at you. I just love you. I'm so glad that the Most High is still working with us in this day and this time. Uh, I'm just, uh, just, I'm overwhelmed seeing the Most High move as he is moving now in this time, in this day and age. And, and so many people are becoming more and more aware that this, everything is coming from the heavens above. It's from the Creator. Many of them are becoming more aware of this, and it's a choice that we have to fight against what the Most High is doing or flow with the Most High and honor Him and what He is doing. So I'm just grateful for you, my brothers and sisters. You are the Most High's best. So I, I'm just telling you right now from my heart, I love you. I just want to let you know I love you and I embrace you with this love. I pray for you with this love. I intercede with you with this love. I think on you with this love. I truly love you and I want the best for you. And I, I just got out of prayer and, and um, I asked the Most High just to have this package delivered to, the, to his people and not only to his people but unto those Gentiles that need to know the truth. Uh, because we are here for a specific reason and we're going to tap on some of that here also uh, this right here is going to take a lot of turns <laughs> the Holy Spirit has been pulling and tugging me and moving me different places in different ways but you know what we're just going to flow with what the Holy Spirit wants because I decrease so that the Holy Spirit can increase I decrease so that the Most High can increase I decrease so that Yeshia Christ can increase so I'm, I'm just surrendered I'm a servant today unto the Most High unto the Kingdom and I'm here to serve, and I'm here to serve you and be a blessing to you. And I hope this message does become a blessing to you, to give you some more insight on some things, and to help you. It's going to help us all. This, this message is going to help us all. I just want everybody to be encouraged right now. We do not need to live in fear right now. And when you understand what the enemy is doing, when you understand the totality of all the things that are going on, your understanding gives you the peace of mind that you need to walk in this kingdom flow of the anointing. So today's, even though we're dealing with the Priest of Mahan part four today, I don't know how many parts of this Priest of Mahan because I, I went in here and I had, I had prepared something that the Holy Spirit had given me. And then this morning, the Holy Spirit just opened my eyes up to so much more. So I don't know. It may be a part five, six, seven, whatever. You know, maybe a series. If it is, that's all right. We're gonna, we we thank the Most High for it. I thank the Most High for it because I didn't know a lot of this stuff before. A lot of this stuff I seen for the first time. And so I thank the Most High for this information, for this truth. And I thank Him for His Word. And I thank Him for His anointed prophets that wrote these scriptures. I thank it for the Holy Spirit moving upon people to write these scriptures. And I just want to I just want to kind of touch on something real quick. Many of us are going out and we buying all these different books and we getting all this different information. I want to touch on something because the Holy Spirit dealt with me this morning, early this morning, and, and it grieved, it grieved me in my spirit because many people are discounting the prophet's words through some of these books that are not even written by anointed people. And so I want you to get an understanding on this. It's okay to read these books and seek these truths and these scriptures and seek some more understanding and get a well-rounded understanding in things. That's fine. I'm not against that. But you need to have a spirit of discernment. You hear what I'm saying? you got to have a spirit of discernment because some of y'all are putting stuff out there that is totally not biblical at all. But because you've read it in some of these other books, you standing behind it and you pushing it out there. And the Holy Spirit showed me that you're creating confusion. You're creating confusion because you're causing people to overthrow the scriptures that were anointed by the Most High. You're causing people to overthrow scriptures that were anointed and approved by her as she moved upon anointed men. You're causing people to overthrow scriptures that were written by men who were carnal. Men of the priesthood of Mahan, because, you know, Nimrod had some priests he established, right? And his priests went against everything that was spiritual. So they wrote some documents that came against things that are spiritual. He was promoted as a king. And so in the king's documents, some of this stuff y'all reading, it ain't, written by, it ain't written by anybody who's anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
So you got to understand who wrote what they wrote, who did what they did, why they're trying these things. So I just want to just touch on some things because some of the stuff y'all putting out there, just because you read it in one book and then you kind of got a, 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 what do you call a, a dirty, uh, mixed up version of it in another book that don't even match up with the other book because it ain't a precept because they, they got different names. They got all kinds of things that's changed. The books don't match up. But here's the thing. You got to understand. Are you going to take man's word over the most high's word? Huh? Are you going to take the word of these men that wrote in these books that ain't even anointed over the most high's word? Because some of y'all putting stuff out there that's totally not biblical. It's totally grieving the Holy Spirit. It is totally. It is totally wrong. And people are believing you and you're creating confusion. You're creating the door. You're opening up the door that the priesthood of Mahan wants you to open up unto the people. And, and cause them to have a strong delusion because they believe in a lie and not the truth. So my thing is, don't, don't, don't look at these other books and make these books that you're reading override the scriptures that are anointed. Override the scriptures that are given by the Most High. Override the scriptures where the Holy Spirit moved upon the men and anointed them to write. Don't you let anything by man override the truth y'all getting out here and getting a bunch of junk food out of these books and you, you you're avoiding the spiritual food you discon you discounting the spiritual food and you letting the junk food be greater than the spiritual food that's what the priest of Muhammad wants you to do don't ever ever let me hear, hear anybody stating that Satan had sex with Eve to conceive Cain that is so not scriptural that is so unbiblical. That is so not of the most high. And you are not relying upon the Holy Spirit if you believe in that and you pushing that, that doggone information. The Holy Spirit got on me this morning about that. She is not happy about that. You overriding to anointed, the anointing that she moved upon Moses. Moses got precepts on this thing. That Adam knew Eve and she bare Cain. In your King James Version Bible and in the book of Moses, in the Pearl of Great Price, Adam knew Eve and she bare Cain. I'm just going to put that out there because the Holy Spirit told me to put that out there. And if you come against me, you're coming against the Most High. Because the men that wrote in them other books that you try to promote and build up, they were not anointed. The Holy Spirit said they were not of her. The Holy Spirit said they were working for the priest of Mahan. Holy Spirit said they were working with the fallen angels. And so some of that stuff y'all reading, y'all talking about the sealed portion, that sealed portion of, 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 of that y'all reading, that sealed portion is also the sealed Mahan book. That's why so many bones and things in there. And the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit said, and the Creator said, and Yeshua said, they don't make mistakes. So they didn't try over and over again to make the human race. They didn't make mistakes. He knows the end from the beginning. He does not make mistakes. It wasn't a trial and error to create human beings. He said that is the, that is the priest of Mahan's effort because the fallen angels to this day have been trying to recreate the creator's human. They've been trying to, that was the fallen angels that was experimenting, using different things to try and create something that was human. It was not them. They don't make mistakes. He said when he, he made man in his own image, that was the start of the thing. He knew the end from the beginning. Priest of Mahan and, and these fallen angels, all of them are involved in all this trying to recreate what the creator has created. He didn't make no mistakes. He didn't have to go first try, second try, third try, fourth try, fifth try. That's the fallen angels doing that. They just twisting it up that truth. See, that's why you can't trust some of this stuff. You got to know, you got to have the spirit of discernment when you're reading these other books. And if you ain't got the spirit of discernment, put these books down. Don't be posting this ungodly mess, making it public and deceiving people. Don't do that. Don't you do that. Nimrod was the son of Cush. And he became the seed of the devil because he made a pact with the devil. 
Adam was Cain's biological father. And you argue with me with this, I'm going to slam you right to the face of the earth. Don't you ever come against what the Holy Spirit has put out on this truth and these anointed scriptures. I'm right there on it. Adam was the biological father of Cain, not Satan. He didn't have sex with no devil. You lost your mind. I'm putting it out there. I'm making it true. You're going to believe what man, the priest of Mahan, and the, and the priest of Mahan wrote versus what the, the, the anointed of the Most High has written? The, the anointed scriptures that are approved by the Most High? Didn't you know Yeshua, when he came, he read the, 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 he read Messiah, he approved things. He saw the truth and confirmed it was the truth. But yet you're going to put man's word over the Most High's anointed word of his confirmed word. How dare you? Even Apostle Ayeel said when you read these other books, you got to throw the bones out because it's a whole bunch of bones in it. Those books are corrupted. They are corrupted. There's a lot of corruption in there. And then you're going to find some things in there that's going to enlighten you on the truth. That's fine. But when you got these things in here and you and you turn around and say the scriptures are a lie, the scriptures are a deception, the scriptures are... De no. The anointing of the Holy Spirit wrote the scriptures. And they don't lie. He said that which his word, he sent his word out to do and that which he sent his word out to do, it will perform. That's his word. He moved his spirit upon Moses. And he wrote the truth. And, and yes, Cain was, ended up being the seed of the devil because he made a pact with the devil, a pact of secrecy. He killed an innocent, righteous man, his brother Abel, to enter into this covenant with Satan. And he became a seed of Satan then and not before then. You got to understand the whole totality of a thing. Stop seeing a smaller picture and then you're going to delete what's spiritual and allow that which is carnal and devilish to override that which is spiritual. The Most High didn't have to do several attempts. He told me, right? He did not have to use several attempts to make man. That's the priest of Mahan. That's why they're still cloning people to this day. They're still trying to create his creation today. That's why they're cloning right now. They're still doing it and can't get it right. Don't play around with the Most High and His Word. Don't let these other books cause you to err from the truth. Because many of you have erred from the truth reading these other books. They're not spiritual. Your understanding ain't spiritual. And don't you put the Holy Spirit behind your, your carnal understanding of what these carnalities and these priests of Muhammad have written in these other books. I'm putting it out there. I may not get a whole lot of friends after this, but I'm putting this truth out there because a lot of y'all are creating confusion. And you're not relying upon the Holy Spirit because she's going to give you a spirit of discernment to know which ones are the bones and which is not. And it just grieved me. I've been carrying this. I've been carrying this. And it's been grieving me. And yeah, I see the post. I see a lot of stuff. I see things right there. I see comments and I don't respond to them because it just grieved me. Because when I want to respond, I really want to get on that thing and chew it down and tear it all the way up. But you know what? The Holy Spirit said speak on it this morning. So I'm speaking on it. Don't let these other books cause you to err from the truth. You let the anointed scriptures by those written by those who the Holy Spirit moved upon with the anointing to write. You let those scriptures reign higher than anything else. And yeah, I got a lot of people that may not agree with what I'm saying, but let me tell you something. I got precepts on it. You look up, the, look at the priest of Mahan one. Look at what it said. It backs up everything. It's precepts on this thing. Y'all sitting up here trying to create this new theology of Eve sleeping with the devil to bear Cain. Y'all wrong. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, you're wrong. You creating this new theology where the Most High had to go over and over and over again to try and create man and get man right. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm telling you. That is, the, that is the fallen angel's attempt to recreate what the Most High has created. That was his attempt, their attempts, because they had fallen, and they're attempting to recreate that. 
And just because they wrote it and twisted it up, you got to look at when you read that stuff right there at that point when you read it in that book. Ask yourself who wrote it. Right there. Right where we right where you reading it. Ask yourself who wrote it. Who wrote it? Was it a prophet of the most high? Hell no. Who wrote it? Ask yourself who wrote it. We know the prophets wrote the Bible. We know the prophets wrote the scriptures. We know the anointed ones wrote it. So when you read them other books and you find this, what you call a jewel of information, right when you get there, ask yourself, who wrote it? Who wrote it? Proof is in the right. Who wrote it? Y'all tearing me up in my spirit. The Holy Spirit ain't, ain't happy with that. And I just got to calm down. Let me just get off of this. It's just, mm. Don't you ever discredit this anointed word of the Most High. Backed by the Rock Hakodesh. Don't you ever discredit this word. When you read these scriptures in the Ruach HaKadosh pop out of these scriptures and hit you in your spirit with these and anoint you as soon as you read them. In fact, the scriptures I wrote, the precepts I wrote, I read in Genesis that Adam knew Eve and bear Cain and the precept I read in the book of Moses out of the Pearl of Great Price that Adam knew Eve and bear son Cain. That anointing came upon me so powerful and strong by the Holy Spirit. I know she backs that. And I know the anointing was on the prophet Moses. I know he was anointed. So who wrote them scriptures you trying to overthrow the anointed one's writings with? Who wrote it? When you read it, ask yourself, who wrote it? Who wrote it? Find out who wrote it. You let man's word override the words of the prophets of the anointed ones of the Holy Spirit. Don't you do that. You got to have a spirit of discernment when you step out on that stuff. Else you're going to get confused and be lost. And you're going to teach others to be lost. The blind lead, the blind, they both fall in the pit. Make sure, like our One Nation, One Power leader says, Apostle I am. When you read these other books, you got to discern. There's bones in there you're going to have to throw out. So a lot of these things that you guys are trying to prove and push and go because it's different information from what you receive, you better understand the first thing you seek is the Holy Spirit. The first thing you seek and you find out who she moved upon to write that. You back it up. You don't back it up with another a, a, a corrupt scripture over here. And then this corrupt scripture over here kind of says, kind of says what this one is saying. But using different names, talking about different people, different situations. It don't even, don't even line up. I know. I know. I know all about that. See a book of portion, lost book of the Bible, I got all that stuff. I read that stuff too. Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were twins. They were not twins. They had twin sisters born. They, that, all that is false. False, false. All that is false. Didn't have no twin, no twin sisters, nothing like that. Then them books had Cain fighting, killing Abel, being jealous over a, 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 a sister that they wanted to marry. False. False information. False. I said boldly. Most high ain't playing with this. And some of y'all getting up in here and you grabbing information that's false, that's ungodly, that's not written by anybody anointed. You got one of the false priests of Mahan, or the priest of Mahan, which is a fake priest. A Mahan who served the king writing this stuff up.
putting these things together, writing these other books. And because they were written in that certain time period, they want to call it a lost book of the Bible. It's a lost book of hell is what it is. Burn it up and throw it right the back to right the hell where it came from. Because it wasn't the devil from hell. Oh man, let me... I didn't know I was going to start out this way this morning. Y'all got to understand something. <laughs> Be led of the Spirit, discerned by the Spirit, and know by the Spirit. And get confirmation of the Spirit. And don't just be putting stuff out there and then you turn around and you blaspheme in the Holy Spirit because the word that the Holy Spirit had Moses write under the anointing as she was upon him, you speaking against that word. So now you blaspheme in the Holy Spirit. You coming against the Holy Spirit's anointing and approved writings of the Most High. Don't put yourself in that position. Don't put yourself in that position. So now, let's go to Genesis chapter 25 and verse 21. We're going to talk about some things. We're going to get on some things in this Priest of Mahan part 4. I trust the Holy Spirit and nobody else. No man, no nothing. I trust the Holy Spirit. So when someone flows in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to trust that anointing because that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going outside all this other stuff. You know, I, I read other books. I do this, that, and the other, right? But I'm going to trust the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Bible doesn't say we compare carnal things with spiritual things. Spiritual things with spiritual things. Genesis 25 verse 21. And here it says that Isaac entreated the Most High for his wife because she was barren. And the Most High was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Most High. And the Most High said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And the manner of people and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bow. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. Okay. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now. The one people shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. And it says when her days to be delivered were fulfilled. Behold there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that, his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And I think Jacob represents, uh, say something like heel snatcher, heel catcher. And Isaac was three score years old when she buried them, so he was 60 years old. Okay. So we're talking about two nations. He said out of these, they're going to be two different people. And, and the, the split between what we would call Jew and what we would perceive as Gentile took place here. So Jacob represents the blessed seed. And Esau represents a people that will be known as the Gentiles in the earth. And yes, we had Gentiles before then, but this is going to be a specific separation of the two. 
and there is an indication behind these two seeds to where the kingdoms, the kingdom of the Most High, will be represented in the kingdom of this earth, or the prince of this world, which is Satan, the kingdom of this earth, shall be represented. So these two seeds are the forefathers of those two kingdoms. One kingdom is going to represent the true church of the Lamb of the Most High. The other kingdom is going to represent the church of Satan. Okay? So it's not divided by nation here. It's divided by people. And so we're going to understand something here in these scriptures. How Esau and Jacob are key factors into this priest of Mahan part four. They are key factors in what's going on in our lives today. And so we're going to hit on some of those things. So let's go and read it just a little bit more. Okay. We're going back and forth. I'm going to be, I'm going to be putting this together however the Holy Spirit leads and guides me in this today. Okay, so now it said uh, in verse 27, it says, And the boys grew, and Esau was a con cunning hunter, a man of the field, right? And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, okay? So right here it told you that even though they were twins, both of these young men had two totally different lifestyles as to how they grew up. They grew up with two totally different lifestyles, okay? One was a hunter, and he was a man of what? The field. Then Jacob, he was a plain man dwelling in tents. Plain man means he was upright. He was a righteous man, okay? He was more of a, a, a man who was uh, lawful. Okay, and so, and he was what we, we would call today a homebody kind of guy. So he got most of his instruction from home. Now, Isaac loved Esau in verse 28 because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So here is two different types of love that these two brothers receive. Now, for those of you who are declaring that Esau is the white man, these two brothers share the same blood here. These two brothers came from two black parents. share the same blood. These two brothers are Hebrews. And these two brothers are black just like their parents. I'm not going against the scripture. It speaks for itself. And for someone to make a declaration that Esau is the white man is the same. You, you don't call the white man Hebrews. Are you walking around calling them Hebrews? Because Esau was a Hebrew. So are you saying the white men are Hebrews too? Are you saying that? Hatred causes people to fixate themselves on things that are untrue. It paints a picture that is not there. And many of these guys that are out here calling Esau the white man or the white men or Edomites and, and all this other stuff, you're speaking this through hatred and you can't see the truth clearly. And you're taking the scripture and trying to, trying to twist it into something that is not. Two black parents, two Hebrew parents. Isaac took a wife of his uncle's, his uncle's daughter's wife. Two black parents, two Hebrew parents. 
Hebrew blood flowing through both of these children. But yet you want to say Esau is white. You done lost your mind. What scripture are you reading? You done twisted it up. You done tainted it up and twisted it up. Even though he was red, he was still black. Look at me, I'm red. I'm black. Think about it. That's as far as I'm going to go with that. Now, Esau, Isaac loved because of he, he did eat of his venison, and Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, Rebekah's love for Jacob goes back to the prophetic words she received about the children in her womb. About the older shall serve the younger. So she knows that Jacob is truly the blessed seed of the two twins because the older shall serve the younger. That's the word she got. And she's hanging on to that word. And the things that she's getting ready to do is because she's hanging on to that word. And why she does what she does is because of the word she received. So we'll get into it. Okay, and it says, And, and uh, Jacob saw it pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore, his name, therefore was his name called Edom. Now, look at this scripture, verse 30. Verse 29 said he was faint. Verse 30, when Esau confessed that he was faint, when he, as a man thinking in his heart, so is he, right? So as Esau confessed he was faint, therefore his confession changed his name to Edom. Edom also means red, okay? And so my thing is here, Jacob, the next verse, let's go to the next verse, let's go. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright be to me? Now, whoo! I, I, I'm really, I'm coming down, y'all, a little bit. But you know what? I'm just, I'm, whoo! I'm, how did anyone ask this question? How did Esau, who is a cunning hunter, the field, he was a man of the field. He was a cunning hunter. How did Esau himself return from the field this day confessing that he is faint and he was about to die? The field is the place where, es uh, where Esau had his skills. He was a skillful man in the field. So what happened this day where first of all Esau came home with no nothing to eat. Esau was at the point to where he was starving. Esau was at the point where he felt he was going to die. He came from the, the rim or the area where he's most skilled at. And he came home from the place of his skills as though he was not skilled at all. As though he all of a sudden didn't know how to hunt. As though he all of a sudden didn't know how to get food for himself. As though he all of a sudden couldn't even be successful to the point to where he felt he was going to die. But he was the skillful hunter. Has anybody ever asked themselves this question? Why Esau came from the field hungry when the field is where he's most skillful at. He's the hunter. He's the most skillful hunter there is. Did anyone ever ask that question? The reason why this question can't be answered in this KJV is because there were some things taken out. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to another passage of scripture. 
that's going to give us a greater understanding as to why in this point in time, Esau got to the point where he was hungry, he didn't have any food, and he thought he was going to die, right? At this point in time, we're going to read into another passage as to why this has taken effect to the point where Esau gave up his birthright. A skillful hunter. The field is his place. He was a man of the field, so he knew it like no other. How did he come home hungry, starving, thinking he was going to die? How? Let's find out. Let's go to the book of Jasher. We're going to go to chapter 27, Jasher 27, and we're going to start at verse 1. So let's get over there to Jasher. 27 and verse 1. In Jasher 27, verse 1, it starts out, And Esau, at that time, after the death of Abraham, frequently went into the field to hunt. And Nimrod, king of Babel, the same was Amraphel, also frequently went with his mighty man, to hunt in the field and to walk about with his men in the cool of the day. And Nimrod was observing Esau all of the days for a jealousy was formed in the heart of Nimrod against Esau all the days. So this right here, this word jealousy right here represents an enmity that was forming uh, from Nimrod against Esau. Esau was a skillful hunter. Nimrod, we know, was a skillful hunter. Okay? And we know that if he had jealousy and it was formed in him all the days, then we know that incorporated with that jealousy, there were some forms of harassment. Nimrod had his boys with him, and I guarantee you there were some forms of harassment going on because he was jealous against him all his days. So there were some things being done. The Bible tells you jealousy is the rage of a man, right? So there were some things that were being done that were causing some uncomfortable situations between Nimrod and Esau, all right? And, and we're getting ready to hit into that and prove that there was, right? And so it said, on a certain day, Esau went into the field to hunt. That's verse 4. And he found Nimrod walking in the wilderness with his two men. And all his mighty men and his people were with him in the wilderness, but they removed at a distance from him. So he was, him and his two bodyguards or two men were at a distance from the, the multitude of the people that were with him, right? And they went from him in different directions to hunt. And Esau concealed himself for Nimrod and he lurked for him in the wilderness. And Nimrod and his men that were with him did not know him. And Nimrod and his men frequently walked about in the field at the cool of the day. And to know where his men were hunting in his field, in the field, right? And Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were when Esau started suddenly from his lurking place and drew his sword and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. I told you they were being harassed. Esau was being harassed by Nimrod. What's going to drive a man to plot on you, to kill you? There had to have been some kind of harassment. All those days, there was some kind of harassment going on. And when Esau caught Nimrod without his full protection, that was his chance to get back at him. And he did. He ran up. And he cut Nimrod's head off. So there you go. That priest of Mahan Nimrod. So he had his last day with Esau. Esau took him out. Took him out. But let's keep reading. And Esau fought a desperate fight with the two men that were with Nimrod. And when they called out to him, Esau turned to them and smote them to death with his sword. 
and all the mighty men of Nimrod who had left him to go to the wilderness heard the cry at a distance. So what happened was Esau had fought the two men and got the best of them. But one of them cried out. So Esau had to go back and kill him to shut him up. But that cry alerted some of the other people that were in the multitude that were at a distance. They were able to hear it. So now Esau runs over, takes him out to keep him from crying again so they won't know of his location. So Esau takes him out. Now Esau's getting ready to flee because he know there's some other people that heard this cry. Watch this. And let's go to verse 9. It said, And all the mighty men of Nimrod who had left him to go to the wilderness heard the cry at a distance. And they knew the voices of those two men. And they ran to know the cause of it. Right? And when they found their king and the two men that were with him lying dead, they were dead at this time in the wilderness. Esau didn't shut them up. Right? And when Esau saw the mighty men of Nimrod coming at a distance, see, he fled. Esau saw these men. He was outnumbered. He fled. He saw them. He fled. He saw them. He fled. And thereby escaped. He had to escape from them, right? And Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod. Now, he took those garments. Now, the garments that the Most High had sold and made for Adam and Eve after they were in the garden. These garments, Nimrod placed these garments on him and it empowered him to be a mighty hunter. Esau took those garments from Nimrod, right? And it says, Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed to Nimrod, and, which, and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land, and he ran and concealed them in his house. See, they, everybody knew that those garments empowered people. It empowered Nimrod. Esau knew that those garments empowered Nimrod. He, he knew they were garments of power. Because the Most High made them specifically for Adam and Eve. So Esau was a mighty hunter and he didn't have the garments. He took out the mighty hunter who had the garments. Well, he took out the one that had the garments. That's how say, I told you Esau was a bad book. So how's he going to come home hungry, faint, and feeling as though he's going to die? It's because he's escaping from Nimrod's men. This is why he had to leave and go and run and escape because he done took out Nimrod and his two soldiers. He done took them out. He said, and Esau took those garments and ran into the city on account of Nimrod's men. And he came unto his father's house weary and exhausted from the fight. See, the fight wore him out. He, he, he didn't just go out and have an unsuccessful day in hunting. He was exhausted from the fight and he was ready to die through grief. When he approached his brother Jacob and sat before him. Why? Because Esau felt that Nimrod's men were going to catch up to him and kill him. So he put himself in a position to be ready to die. Because he knew there was a greater company of men that's possibly coming after him. And when they find him, they're going to take him out of this world. So he prepared himself to die. So at that point, when Esau prepared himself to die, his birthright meant nothing to him. What am I going to do with a birthright if I'm getting ready to die? And I got a great company of men looking for me to take me out. They didn't know who it was Esau. But Esau didn't know that they did not know it was him. Esau didn't know that they did not pick up who he was. Esau thought they were going to track him down and kill him at this time. He was ready to die. So this is what when he was exhausted in your KJV Starts in this part where he was exhausted and came in from the field and give me some pottage and, and it, that's where it starts in KJV but it didn't it leaves off the other part of the story as to why he was faint as to why he felt he was gonna die do you hear what I'm saying it leaves off that part and that's a very beautiful part that we need to have in this story to know what's going on with Esau's life and why he gave up his birthright. It leaves the questions in the KJV, but the book of Jasher answers a lot of those questions. And he said unto his brother Jacob, Behold, I shall die this day. And wherefore, 
then do I want the birthright? He said, yeah. He, he thinking he's going to die. So why, why do I want the birthright? They get ready to come kill me. And Jacob acted wisely with Esau in this manner. And Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. For it was so brought about by the Most High. And Esau's portion in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham had brought, bought from the children of Heth for the possession of a burial ground, Esau also sold to Jacob. And Jacob bought all this from his brother Esau for value given. See, Esau gave up everything he had. He didn't just give up his birthright. He gave up the possessions he owned. He thought he was going to die. He thought these men were going to kill him. He just took out Nimrod. He had a host of whole, whole host of men looking for who took out Nimrod and them two soldiers. He thought he was going to die. He thought he was getting ready to get, he, 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 was, he was doing his last thing. He said, I can't have this land. I don't need these possessions. I'm getting ready to die. What good are they to me? Esau gave up everything. And Jacob wrote the whole of this in a book. And he testified the same with witnesses. And he sealed it. And the book remained in the hands of Jacob. And when Nimrod, the son of Cush, died, his men lifted him up and brought him in consternation and buried him in his city. And all the days that Nimrod lived were 215 years and he died. And the days that Nimrod reigned upon the people of the land were 185 years. And Nimrod died by the sword of Esau. And shame and contempt. And the seed of Abraham caused his death as he had seen in his dream. The seed of Abraham caused his death as he had seen in a dream. And at the death of Nimrod, his kingdom became divided into many divisions. And all those parts that Nimrod reigned over were restored to the respective kings of the land who recovered them after the death of Nimrod. And all the people of the house of Nimrod were for a long time enslaved to all the other kings of the land. Nimrod got taken out by Esau. Esau felt the company of men, Nimrod's men on, the he, on his heel. And he knew, he didn't know if he escaped them or not. He didn't know if they didn't, if he, he was able to get away without them knowing who he was or not. So he felt his life was in danger. He felt he was getting ready to die. So he gave up his birthright. He gave up his possessions. See, KJV just, just talks about a birthright. But Esau gave up his possessions. See how much information is missing? And see how the anointing is still upon me? And it's uh, this is the anointed word of the Most High? And you can't go against this? This is the truth written by anointed prophets of the Most High? See, you got to flow with the anointing and have to discern this word. You can't just be throwing up any kind of thing up in here. We found out why Esau gave up his birthright and gave up everything, right? Now, I'm going to key off of two things. I'm going to key off of two things. And we're going to go to the story. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole story, but we're going to deal with some things, okay? Let's go to this story of when Isaac felt he was going to die and he had to he was getting ready to put the blessings upon his sons, right? Let's go there. That's going to be uh, Genesis chapter 27 verse 25. I'm not going to go through the whole story. So let's go there. Genesis 27 verse 25. Okay? Now, this is after Rebecca when she uh, informed Jacob that the father Isaac is getting ready to bless him. And she set it up to where Jacob can receive the blessing. She set this up not because of ill will. She set this up because of the prophecy. It's because of the prophecy that she got when they were still in her womb of the older serving the younger. So she knew that the younger child or the one that came out second in this case 
was the one that was supposed to receive the blessing because the older is supposed to serve the younger. So Rebecca stayed faithful to the prophecy that the Most High had given her. So she set it up to where when Isaac told Esau he was getting ready to bless him to go out and, and, and go out in the field and, and hunt and bring home some venison, they went ahead, Rebecca put together her plan, and she set up Jacob to and she prepared this venison, she set it up and everything. And put hairy, uh, hairy coat on Jacob and and made sure Jacob felt like Esau. Everything, Jacob smelled like Esau, Jacob felt like Esau, but his voice was not Esau's voice. But Rebecca set this up according to the prophecy that she had given. And she it, it was like she was doing everything the Most High said to do so her son, Jacob, could receive the blessing of Isaac. Now, we're we getting ready to go here. We're getting ready to go here. Because if you look at this, Esau had already sold his birthright. Esau had already sold his possession. You hear what I'm saying? Unto Jacob. Okay? Now, Esau gave up his birthright and his possessions unto Jacob. Why? Because what did he kill Nimrod with? He killed Nimrod with the sword. That killing with the sword of Nimrod is to signify something. We're getting ready to see what it signifies. Now, verse 25, he says, And bring it near me. This is uh, Isaac talking to Jacob. And I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and brought, it, brought him wine and drink. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near, verse 27, And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of what? His raiment. And he blessed him and he said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field which the Most High has blessed. Therefore, the Most High give thee of the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let the people serve thee and the nations. This is where nations come in now. When Rebekah got the prophecy from the Most High, he said, In your womb are two people. All right. Now, whew, we're getting ready to go somewhere deep here. We're getting ready to go somewhere. We're, we're going to hit on it. We, ooh, let, me, let me flow with the, what the Spirit is doing now. We're getting ready to go somewhere. Watch this. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing, Jacob, see, he's blessing Jacob here, as the firstborn, thinking it was Esau, right? And Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And he also made savory meat and brought it in unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac did what? He trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that had taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, my father, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not the rightly named Jacob? Is not he, or, or he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he had supplanted me these what? Two times. <coughs> and he took away my birthright. And behold, now he taken away my blessing. And he said, has thou not reserved a blessing for me? 
And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy lord, and all his brethren I have give, given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and the dew of heaven from above. And by the sword shall thy live. That sword. Look at there. Look, look, look here. Y'all look at this. He used the sword to behead Nimrod. And here's confirmation. When he's getting the blessing from his father Isaac, he said, And by the sword shalt thy live, and shalt thy serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have dominion, when thou shalt have dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob. Esau hated Jacob. We're gonna, well, I'm saying this for a reason. We're going to hit on some things. Because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. He's waiting for his father. After his father passes away, he's purposing in his heart to destroy Jacob, to slay him. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. We're getting ready to do something here. I want you to think of two words right here, and it's very near what we're getting ready to hit on. Think of two words. Think of the blessing, the blessing, and, uh, and think of the sword. Two words, the blessing, the sword, the blessing, the sword, the blessing, the sword. Well, let's, let's, say, let's see how Jacob was established here in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 1. Let's see how Jacob was established. He said, and there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Ambimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Most High appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. I will perform an oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In thy seed all nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, Jacob, the blessing that Isaac had given unto Jacob was a blessing according to this seed which the Most High had spoke unto Isaac. And so when he blessed Jacob, his firstborn, he blessed him with the same blessing the Most High had pronounced unto him. So Jacob represents the blessed seed, and it re represents the seed that's going to bless what? All the nations of the earth. So through this seed, this Israelite seed, where we, 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 we become Israelites, right? Jacob's name changed to Israel and we become the Israelites. Through this seed, we hold the responsibility of blessing all the nations, not cutting the nations off, not telling them they're just going to go to hell and there's no hope for them. We hold the responsibility as the blessed seed of Israel to bless all nations. He's using one seed to bless all nations on the earth. That's our responsibility. So if we have these people out here on the corners telling people they're just going to go to hell, there's no hope for them, you're not the blessed seed. You're not doing what you purpose to do and what has been spoken and prophesied over you to perform. 
The reason why you exist is so that you can bless all nations. Not curse the nations. Bless all nations. Uh, the law came through us. Civilization came through us. The establishment of civilization was learned from the other nations through us. We were the only people who know how to live in peace with one another because of the law, statutes, and the commandments. No other people on the earth knew how to live in peace. It was dominance, it was control, but they lived by the seed that was produced from Esau. Esau represents a people, all the other nations, the Gentile nations, not just Edomites. Oh man, y'all ain't getting this thing right. It represents so many different nations. But what does Esau represent? He killed Nimrod with the sword. And when Isaac blessed Esau, he said, you will live by the sword. So the saying, the survival of the fittest, that is not a saying that's appropriate for Israelites because we are people who are civilized. We have moral laws and we know how to dwell and live in peace with one another because of those laws. Survival of the fittest are for lawless people, people who have no law. They live by the sword. The survival of the fittest is those who live by the sword. So all the seed that came after Esau were the people who live by the sword. And they are all the nations who became confederate against Israel to destroy us. They live by the sword. Do you understand that? Let's go even further. Isaac, he killed, Esau killed Nimrod with the sword by beheading him. Isaac blessed him, letting him know that he will live by the sword, right? So because of that, the blessing, that everything that came out of Esau's seed and his generations to come and the people and the nations that were going to be established down the line, they were all a people who learned survival of the fittest. In other words, live by the sword. That's where that phrase comes from, survival of the fittest. Those who live by the sword, right? So Jacob lived by the blessing of the Most High. Esau lives by the sword. Watch this. We're going to do some things. We're going to go some places. This is beautiful. Y'all got to understand something. Esau is not just a representation of Edom. Y'all got to understand. There are so many nations that came out of Esau. It, it ain't even funny. Okay. Let's go. We're going to go to Genesis 26. Let's go down to verse 34. And, he, and it says in verse 34, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Okay? Now, Judith and, and, and this, this, this Hittites... Hittites are, are, are descendants of Canaan, okay? They're, they're, they're descendants of Canaanite. A Hittite is a descendant of Cheth, which is C-H-E-T-H, -E okay? And Cheth is an aboriginal Canaanite. So, the, so Esau took wives of the Canaanites, okay? And in fact, Judith, the name Judith means Canaanitis, okay? And then Bashemeth, that name means fragrance, okay? But he took Canaanite wives together. And we're going to see when Esau, you're talking about people who live by the sword, right? We're going to look and see when we start looking at some of Esau's descendants, right? Whew. We start looking at his descendants, we start seeing some of the corruption that's going on, okay? So let's go to Genesis now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 36, verse 2. Let's go there. He said, And Esau 
took his wives of the daughters, daughters of Canaan. See, the Canaanites, all right? Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholibimah, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, right? And Bashemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. And Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashemath bare Ruel, okay? So now, the daughters of Canaan. Now, he took to get wives of the daughters of Canaan. Now, one of the meanings of the word Canaan means humiliated. I mean, remember when Noah cursed the seed of Canaan? Okay. When he cursed that seed, it was, it was because, you know, the, the act of humiliation that took place. Right. So Canaan means humiliation. So when Rebecca had talked with Isaac about Esau and his Canaan, Canaanite wives, uh, Isaac and Rebekah were both grieved and then Isaac had a conversation with uh, Jacob letting him know that he cannot take a Canaanite wife okay because of what Esau had done it had grieved them so it hu humiliated Isaac's seed so that's another thing now, humiliation goes towards the seed of Esau because of the Canaanite wives he took he humiliated the seed of his father Isaac, right? And then Jacob did as his father had instructed, and he took took together a Hebrew wife, and it pleased him. So, so here's the thing: in Genesis two, he said he said uh, uh, he she bare Ada bare a son, and verse four says Ada bare a son to Esau Eliphaz, right? Ada means ornament. Right, so here we go. We're starting to. You got to look at the names of people that's starting to come out into the seed, into the. I guess you call the genealogy, of Esau. Some of these names, everything we name, people, it had meaning back in the day. Their names carried meaning. Okay, just like a human, an act of humiliation created the Canaanite seed and it was cursed by Noah the name Canaan means humiliation right so now he's got Ada a wife whose name means ornament okay now we're starting to get into ornaments we're starting to get into images ornaments idolatry right okay and then now in verse 5 it says in that a whole a holy bimah bear Jeush and Jalem and Korah and these are the sons of Esau which were born unto him in the land of Canaan right so Jalem okay the son Jalem his name means a cult see evil is creeping up in the seed so you have to see that in, in, in the line of Esau the occult idolatry everything coming against so so when he took out Nimrod was the priest of Mahan done away with? No, it wasn't. These people became a people who lived by the sword, who were lawless people. And here, here we go, establishing idolatry. And now we got a son named Jalem. There's the occult. The occult comes out of the seed of Esau. Come on now. And then verse 36 and 6, Esau took his wives and his sons, his daughters, and all his persons, and his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts. All right, and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For what? For their riches were more than they than that they might dwell together. So they both were blessed. They both multiplied. They both were blessed physically in riches and cattle and substance, right? And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle so they both had wealth thus dwell Esau in what Mount Seir and it says right here Esau is Edom he dwelt in Mount Seir okay so when he goes over into Mount Seir you know he you start looking at some more things that starts happening here right now it said, and these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites. He's the father of the Edomites, okay? But he's the father of more nations of people, okay? He's the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir, okay? 
he dwelt here in Mount Seir. But you got to understand there, there are some things taking place here in Mount Seir. Let's let's hit on them. Let's go. Okay. Now, verse 10. Okay. Now let's go to verse 9. There are the names, these are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau. Ruel, the son of Bashemath, the wife of Esau, and the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Ophar, Zepho, Gatim, and Kenaz. And Timnah was a concubine to Eliphaz's son. Now, Timnah was a concubine to Eliphaz's son. Concubines, okay? Eliphaz did not even honor her as a wife, right? And she bare Eliphaz Amalek. So, the woman he went into as a concubine and did not honor her as a wife and refused to honor her as a wife, she bared the nation, Amalek. <laughs> it is said these were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife, right? Oh my goodness gracious, we can go on and on. I'm just going, I'm just hitting on, I'm hitting on these other nations that's going out, out of Esau's seas, Amalek. Amalek were a vicious people who lived by the swords. They were, they were vicious on the earth. Amalek was the people the Most High wanted Saul to take out. He didn't take them all out. He wanted their seed blotted out from the earth because they were vicious people. Amalek were evil people. That's where your, uh, the people who eat can cannibals, that's where they come from. Amalek, those people were, were cannibals, known as cannibals, right? Amalek were wicked and, and they, they, all these nations coming out of Esau, his descendants, all these nations, these people live by the sword now. Esau took off Nimrod's head by the sword. The blessing he got from his father was that he would live by the sword. And all of his descendants and all the nations after him that come down in his genealogy line, every last one of them lived by the sword. They were not a people of the law. They were not a people of the commandments. They were not a people of the statute. They were a people who lived by the sword. So they became vicious people upon the earth. Okay? And we're going to confirm all of this. We're, getting, we're just going. I'm just going to hit on something. Because y'all know Amalek, the Most High, is going to destroy Amalek. He has enmity against Amalek now. He's getting ready to take him out because when he trusted a man to do it, he didn't fulfill the job. When he trusted Saul to do it, he didn't fulfill the job. So that's why I repented him that he even, even created man because he didn't take out this vicious evil seed who had such a high pure blood of the fallen angels of the Nephilim in them that they did, they performed acts of the Nephilim to the T. Amalek was a vicious people in this earth and they still here eating people. That's why some of these people that are disappearing, they showing up on these people's tables being eaten. They got people eating people now. They, they taking children. They doing all that. Amalek is still doing his thing in the earth right now. That spirit is still here. That people is still here. The descendants are still here. So this was a, a seed of, this was a nation of people that came out of the bloodline of Esau. Right? Amalek. Because he mingled his seed with humiliation, which is Canaan. And then from Canaan, you became ornaments with idolatry, then you became the occult with satanic worship, and now you got Amalek, which is vicious idolatry, Satan, sa Satan reproducing people, pretty much, because they're doing and fulfilling the acts of the fallen angels. Amalek was the most purest bloodline of the Nephilim people on the earth. And, and you can tell because they do the same things as the Nephilim did. The Nephilim had a diet for humans. And Amalek had a diet for humans. The cannibals came out of Amalek. The mass murderers came out of Amalek. Your serial killers came out of Amalek. Live by the sword. All of his seed began to live by the sword. So, so if we all to talk about the Edomites is a white man, Esau is the white. Get, get, no, you got to look at all these nations that are not Jews. You got to look at all these nations that are living by the sword. You got to look at all these nations. That are lawless. All of them. They all got their own form of wickedness. How they survive. It's the fittest of the survival. You hear what I'm saying? Only the strong will survive kind of mentality. Living by the sword. 
Each every one of them has their say their different concept of how they live by the sword. Every last one of these other nations that are not Jews, that are not Israelites, they live in by the sword. They don't have the law. They don't have the commandments. They don't have the statutes. They live by the sword. And that's why they were able to get themselves together and form a union to come against us, the blessed seed. Because they want to destroy us from off the earth because they live by the sword. They want to have what? What, what happened? Esau told, uh, 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 Isaac told uh, Esau what? He said the yoke will be taken off and destroyed off of his neck when he has what? Dominion. So how is Esau getting dominion? Esau is spreading his seed to different nations, to different people, so that they can come together like they did in Psalms, uh, what is that, 83? Confederate against Israel. So he's spreading it to come against Israel. To come against the blessed seed of Jacob. Because he hated his brother. And he sought to slay and kill his brother from his heart. So even though they did dwell in the land together to the point where they both richly multiplied. And they didn't kill one another. Esau still hated his brother in his heart. Esau still wanted to slay his brothers. Now, you see in the descendants of Esau in the earth and all these different nations that have come against Israel. Watch these seeds of Esau just start popping up and manifest. Because Esau, he not, only, he not only dealt with his seed dealing with the Canaanite women, but he went over to Japheth's side too. Why do you think Alexander... And after 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 uh, Chittim, which is the people of Japheth, took over uh, Edom. Right? They had a war with Edom and took over Edom, and Edom had to come into one government. Oh, we go. Oh man, I wish I covered. I may have to do this on the, uh, on another series. Chittim took over Edom and made Edom bow down and walk into their government and follow after their governing ways. Right? Edom, that seed of Esau, was taken over from Chittim, which is the seed of Japheth. So, but they grew together and they lived together to the point to where there was a king out of Chittim that conspired against the Israelites. Alexander the Great, y'all know him. He's out of Chittim, out of that seed of Japheth. And then he warred against the Israelites and drew, oh man. Oh, man, I, don't know why I got to get into it. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to have to get into that a little bit more. We will. Well, I guess we're going to have a little bit more series, so I, we'll see how the Most High does this. But I want you to know here that when Esau started going here, let's go, uh, let's go down to Timna was a concubine. Wasn't even Eliphaz as Esau's son, but she bare Amalek. Unto it, it's the bloodline of Esau. Amalek comes out of Esau, right? And now let's skip down because there's so much stuff going in here. Let, let ooh. And Timna, the name Timna means restraint. You know, you know. So the mother of Amalek. Come on now. So so let's go down to Genesis. We're in chapter 36, right? Let's go down to like verse 20, okay? Verse 20 says, "These are the sons of." Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Anah. Now, Seir, the Horite, okay, who inhabited the land, okay, Horites were called cave dwellers. They're troglodytes, okay. Whoo! There's all kinds of things that came out of these, these Horites. Here we go. Amalek, wicked, evil people, cannibals, serial murders, serial killers, live by the swords. Here we go. Now we got Horites, people who mingled and had sex with animals, had offsprings of what they call satires. Oh, oh I get into it. I got a story on that. I just, I just have to get into it a little bit more. Had all these kind of these cave dwellers. These cave dwellers, they had people that dwell in these caves that were half man, half animal. Yeah. 
and it's in your Bible. S A T Y R S, satires in your Bible. That's that's called the the the, the he goats. That's in your Bible, and that and I, I and yeah. Yeah, we get on it. I just don't. I I can't get out coming all of this. But I, I let me tell you something. I just want to touch on some things here on verse twenty. It says these are some of the these are the sons of Seir, the Horite who inhabited the land: Lotan, Shobal, and Zibian, and Ani, and Dishon, and Ezer, and Dishon. And these are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. Now these children corrupted themselves. They were corrupt already intertwine themselves in Edom with Esau's seed, right? And the children of Lotan, Lotan were Hor, Hori and Himam, and Lotan's sisters was Timnah. See, see, that's that's showing you that Esau's seed had mingled with, you hear what I'm saying? These Horites, these people, right? Because Timnah is the same Timnah in which Eliphaz made a concubine with and birthed Amalek. This is the same Timnah. Which is Lotan's sister. See what I'm saying? So they, they now you're dealing with Horites, people who, yeah, offsprings of various things. Now I'm just going to just just I can't go too far in detail, but I can. I will. I want to show scriptures in support of what I'm saying. I just don't have it right now. I have it, but I'm just not not going there right now. The Holy Spirit's not leading me to go to that scripture right now to deal with that story. But you know, Timna was the mother of. Amalek, and that, that, and see, all this corruption is coming in through this line. All these Horites, all these different people, right, are coming in as descendants of Esau. Okay, they're all people who live by the sword. Yeah, I want y'all to see that, right? Let me go to Jasher 61 and 15. Let's go to Jasher 61 and 15. And Zepho went and saw. And Zepho went and he saw, and behold, there was a large cave at the bottom of the mountain. Now, this is the same area uh, where Esau, Mount, Mount, Mount Seir. This is that same area where Edom and the Horites and all these people were dwelling. Okay? And then Chittim, on, on a portion of this, Japheth's seed was living in the area too. Okay? So now we're going to just touch on something. And Zepho went and he saw and behold there was a large cave at the bottom of the mountain and there was a great stone there at the entrance of the cave. And Zepho split the stone and he came into the cave and he looked and behold a large animal was devouring the ox. From the middle upward it resembled a man and from the middle downward it resembled an animal. And Zepho rose up against the animal and slew it with his swords. In the inhabitants of Chittim, that's that's East, that's Japheth's seed right there, Chittim. Chittim is Japheth's seed. So Japheth's seed was in the area too, along with Esau's seed, with Edomites, and along with these Horites all around Mount Seir, these cave dwellers, right? And these cave dwellers, they had some cave dwellers that had half man, half goat. If you see right here, he said uh, the, the top upward resembled a man, and from the middle downward resembled an animal. This, this is one of those, those satires they call he goats, right? Yeah, they exist. Y'all thought it was, they exist. Yeah. And he said, And the inhabitants of Chittim heard this thing, and they rejoiced exceedingly, and they said, What shall we do unto this man who has slain this animal that devoured our cattle? See, this he goat, cave dweller, would destroy their, their, their flocks, their stock, their cattle. And, and, and so they rejoiced. When Zepho ended up killing this he goat, because that thing brought him grief, because he was going out eating their cattle, slaughtering their ox and cattle. He was devouring the ox in the cave when he came up on him, right? So the people were so glad that he was they, he destroyed this satire, right? All they and they all assembled to consecrate one day in the year to him, and they called the name there of Zepho after his name. And they brought unto him drink offers, offerings year after year on that day. And they brought unto him gifts. See? So now you got Esau intermingling with these Horites, intermingling with Chittim, uh, Japhat C. You got, you know, he's dealing with Canaanites, Ham, Japhat. He's intermingling everything. But these were people that were living by the sword. They were people that were lawless. They didn't have the law. 
So the people who didn't have the law, they live by the sword. Now let's let's go let's go and in one other scriptures. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring this to a close. It's just it's so much that I have. I just thought I'm like okay, the Holy Spirit gave me a whole lot. Then I'm thinking okay, okay, well maybe Holy Spirit we go here we go there. But she gave me a whole lot, y'all. She gave me a whole lot. So I'm grateful because it looks like this is going to be an ongoing journey for us in this uh, order of recently this order of Mahan. But what I want you to understand, which those two people that were in the womb of Rebecca, one seed is blessed and one seed is living by the sword. And that's determined from the blessing that Isaac the father gave upon those two sons. Jacob's seed is blessed. And, and, and so the old, older will serve the younger because the, Isaac blessed Jacob. Esau's seed must live by the sword. They still will be blessed now. But he said the yoke of Jacob will be broken off of his neck when they have dominion. So you got to understand those who live by the swords are living in an attempt to get dominion over the blessed seed. And if you see that now, most of the Israelites, we are held what? Captive. We're in the four corners of the earth scattered. And we're in what? Captivity. So since we're in captivity in the four corners of the earth scattered, who has dominion? Think about it. So Psalm 83, when they purposed and came confederate against us to destroy us as a nation, that was to establish their dominion. So who has dominion now? Think about it. Who has dominion? The Gentiles. The Gentiles has dominion. That was the only way the yoke of Jacob was going to be destroyed, broken off of their neck. To have dominion. That was the blessing that came unto Esau. Y'all got to look at this thing. It's a so. This is whoa. It's right there in front of you. Right there. Right there in front of you. Watch this. Watch this. Brother, uh, brother, I yield brought this out the other day. I'm gonna bring it out too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it out. We get ready to come to a close here because I don't, I don't want to hold you for too much longer. But we're just gonna have to go to a part five. And, and I know y'all gonna be blessed. Y'all be looking forward to it. We just gonna have to go to a part five. I thank the most high for it because he's given me more than enough. But we have something to where we can get some understanding on some of the things that have taken place in our past that is affecting us right now today. Okay? Now look, in uh, uh, page 113, this is uh, uh, the Seal Book of Mormon, and it's going to be uh, chapter 14. I'm on page 113, chapter 14, verse 10, right? And he said, and the Most High spake unto me, saying, Behold, I am the, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, your forefathers. And immediately I was filled with fear and trembling in all the and trembling in the all of my being. And I cast my face to the ground, for I was afraid to look upon the face of the Most High and to die. As the elders of Midian related unto me that no man could see the Most High and live, right? Verse 11, and the Most High said, Obviously, I have seen the affliction of my people in the land of Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of the oppression of those who forced them to work. We forced to work everywhere. Survival of the fittest. We went from, we went from a system to where we look out for one another and we make sure every need is met. Now look at this, the true church. Make sure everybody's need is met. And they labor and work together for the benefit of each other. Right? To be a blessing unto each other. To keep charity among each other. To keep compassion among each other. To make sure the needs are met of each other. Now we're in a system of oppression. That's, this, is, this is the dominion that Esau, that blessing upon Esau. To establish dominion to break the yoke off of his neck. Because in this point, the Gentiles are living in freedom. In America, they are free and they're expressing, they're living in their freedom. So the yoke of Jacob has been taken off of their neck. And because of that freedom, they place the Israelites in captivity, right? We're in a place to where, wow, look, look, this Egypt is all the whole world now. It's not just in one spot now. Egypt is the whole world because we scattered to the four corners of the earth. So Egypt is the whole world. So watch this. 
And he said, I have seen the affliction of my people in the land of Egypt, the whole world. And I have heard their cry because of the oppression of those who forced them to work. We have to work in order to live now, right? We have to work in order to survive now, right? For I know their pains, and for this reason I am coming down to deliver my people of the oppressive hand of Pharaoh. We got many Pharaohs all over. Governments, everything. What did Nimrod establish? Governments to strip us of what? Our spiritualness, our spiritual power, our spiritual connection. So now Pharaoh's in charge, and he's making you bow down to his government, bow down to his ways, right? And lead them to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and of the Hittites and of the Amorites and of the Perizzites and of the Hivites and of the Jebusites. These are those tribes who have been inf who have been infected in your progeny by Anakim, okay? And his rebellious angels. See, the, he, he's talking about these people. Now, look at here. I want y'all to see something. All these people he's talking about are people that exist after the flood. So for some of y'all that said, I was like, oh, he talking about Amalek or it had the purest blood or the of the uh, 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 Nephilim and all that. All that stuff was before the flood. They were destroyed. No. All these people right here in this scripture that he's talking about, these nations of people he's talking about here are the ones that existed after, after, after the flood. So guess what? The fallen angels had did mingle themselves with these people because now their seed, he's, like he was saying, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and of the Jebusites. These are those tribes who have been infected with your progeny by Anakil and his rebellious angels. They have been infected by these fallen angels. This is after the flood. Come on, man. Before they were all thrown into prison, okay, when they made their pact with Satan on Mount Hermon, just after the waters, just after, just after, just after the waters of the flood to dry. All these other nations, we are responsible to bring in these commandments, the law, statutes, and the blessings unto all these other nations. The Most High is leading me somewhere else. I'm going to have to go there. Where are we going? Just tell me to turn these pages. Okay. Okay, Amos. Amos 1 and 11. Holy Spirit told me to turn these pages. I'm going to Amos 1 and 11. After that scripture, she wants me to go to Amos 1 and 11. Let's see what we got there. It says here, Thus said the Most High, For three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword. What? I told you, who, who lives by the sword? Esau, see, the blessing came and it's going down to his generation, his seed, his people lives by the sword. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity and his anger did tear perpetually and he kept his wrath. Esau's wrath is hatred in his heart. It's in his heart. They'll be friendly to your face, but they hate you in their in they heart. They want to see you die in their heart. They're friendly to your face, but they want to see you die in their heart. They're plotting against you. They're doing things in the background. They're doing things in secrecies to destroy you. they confederate against you. In their heart, they have wrath on you, against you. They hate you. Just like their father, Esau, did when he hated Jacob. He carried that on down into his seed. Three transgressions of Eden. And he said he will not turn away the punishment thereof. So there, there, there comes a time when they're going to all be punished. All these Gentile nations are going to be punished. Esau seed intermingled with, it, with the Canaanites, with Ham seed, with Japheth seed. So all of these nations, these other nations, these are people, right? A people who what? Live by the sword. A people who what? Are lawless. The people who what live by the strongest shall survive. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the strongest. 
living by the sword. That's the mythology of living by the sword. A coming against a people who are civilized, who have moral laws, who have the commandments, who have the law of the Most High, who can establish the light and the righteousness in the earth. The Israelites, they have all come confederate against us. And they live by the sword. And they want to destroy us. And they hate us. Even when we have not wronged them. They hate us simply for who we are. So I want you to understand some things. That there are many nations that are coming against us as Israelites. It's not just a white man. No, it's not that. And you got and you can't even put it in that category because many of them, the white men, are standing up for us and fighting for us. They coming in with Israel. They are gonna be counting among us. Many of them are fighting for us right now, coming into this truth. They getting baptized, putting these books together, coming forward. Because a lot of them choose to love rather than hate. A lot of them choose to obey the Most High than to go into these occults and to go into all of these things. I can go further even down. When you look at that Genesis, I look at that Genesis, I can go down. I can just go into all those names that come right under Esau. And it's going to tell you, uh, sun worship, a cult. It's gonna, all these names coming out of the Esau Sea dealing with everything they're dealing with. Uh, idolatry, paganism, occultic, sun worship. It deals with everything that is not of the Most High. All their names start. You look at their names, it's, it'll shock you. Then descendants coming out of uh, Esau. All those names, it will shock you. And all of them have meaning and all of them executed. Everything. All their cult, all that stuff that coming out of that. Priest of Mahan. All that comes out of that. All that comes. I may have to do a lesson where I just teach on just those names and, and what just actually came out of Esau. You start seeing, you know, all of these religions false religions false forms of worship idolatry worship all this stuff start coming out of that seed and then here comes ham seed getting along with it and here comes Japheth seed driving right in there the driving force right in there with it Japheth seed started erecting temples unto idol worship all kinds of things so it's it's a lot of stuff that we're dealing with but this this series is is Wow, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm hoping y'all were blessed today. Uh, this blessed me because some of this stuff just hit me for the first time. And so it blessed me. It, 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 just, it just blessed me. And I thank the Most High for it. And I, I give honor and praise unto the Most High. Just know as an Israelite that we are the blessed seed and we're responsible for bringing this blessing unto all nations. And just know that all of these other nations that have come confederate against us, it's not just one. There's various nations that are confederate against us. So you have to understand that we carry the laws of the Most High in our spirit and our hearts. And we have a desire to obey these laws. But these other nations, they are lawless people and they live by the sword. And they have established the dominion that was promised unto Esau that will break and destroy the yoke off of his neck. But guess what? The Most High is getting ready to reverse their dominion and strip them of their dominion because guess what? They ain't doing right with this dominion, right? They still treating us as captives. They still hating on us. They still have a wrath against us. So the Most High said they will not go unpunished. He will punish them. So their time of punishment has come upon them. And that's why they flipping out right now because they sense the dominion that they had slipping away. They know their dominion is slipping away. They know their power is going away. And they know the Most High is getting ready to bring us back into the dominion because we know who we are. They tried to wipe us out. They tried to make us forget our own identity. You know how much of a plot that is? How powerful that is? How somebody can put together a plot that can make you forget your own identity. Do you know how powerful that is? We didn't even know our own identity. They did everything to wipe out the existence of Israel. And the Most High 
through his Holy Spirit and his appointed time began to awaken us. And now we know our identity. And now their dominion is slipping away. So the yokes on their neck is going to be placed right back on it. Because they have to be punished. Because they established dominion through hatred, through wrath, through destruction, through lawlessness. So now those who are obeying the laws, the statutes, and the commandments of the Most High, getting ready to be raised up. You stay right there where you at. Staying focused on him, having that faith in him. You stay right there because he's going to raise you up. He's protecting you now. He's protecting your ground. Walk around the grounds of your house and declare it's holy so that even your grass and whatever plants you're growing, everything you put together, it's going to be blessed. So I make a declaration unto you to understand your purpose in this day of time as you have been awakened unto this truth. We all need to share this truth unto all people, unto all nations. This ain't the time for us to cut them off. This ain't the time for us to walk out in wrath and vengeance against them. This is the time for us to share it unto all nations because guess what? The Bible just named 12 gates to this city of the New Jerusalem. And all these gates have the name of the tribes of Israel on it. So anybody that's going to enter into the city got to come in and be engrafted in with us. They got to cling on to us. They got to believe what we believe. They got to come in and serve as we serve. They got to obey as we obey. They got to fulfill these commandments as we fulfill these commandments. Because guess what? They got to come in through one of the gates. There ain't no other gates. There ain't no gate for a Gentile. The 12 tribes of Israel's name is above each gate. So everybody coming into this new Jerusalem, guess what? You got to cling on to Israel now. It's time for you to cling on to us. It's time for you to get into this truth with us. It's time for you to get into this righteousness with us. It's time. It's the time. The time is now. This time is now. It's something. It's something. You're going to have to learn how to love us. You're going to have to learn how to accept what the Most High has already put together. Because all them gates, them 12 gates is named after black people. They all black. So y'all got to get used to loving the black people all over again. Y'all got to strip out all that hatred and everything you've been taught to try and establish dominion over us and put us underneath you and realize that we are the true people. And once you realize we are the true people, you come on board with us and you serve the true most high. You serve the creator of all things. You come on and you serve as we serve. You obey these commandments as we obey these commandments. You repent and be baptized as we have. You come into this kingdom like we have because you're going to have to cling on to us now because we have this truth and we carry this truth and we put these two books together and now we carry the truth in the fullness of the gospel in the order of Melchizedek. So understand that. We put these books together. We put this truth together and you've got to follow in on this truth or else you will be totally condemned. Period. There's no salvation for you if you don't believe in this truth as we believe. If you don't follow in righteousness as we follow in righteousness, if, we don't, if you don't obey these commandments as we obey, if you don't repent and be baptized, you got to get into this thing. you got to listen to Israel now. we got something for all the nations now. It's our time now to share with all the nations now. So I give the Most High the glory, the honor, and the praise. And I thank the Most High for you, all my beautiful people, my brothers and sisters who are in this truth. You do. You are commissioned now. You have a greater commission now. It's time to execute that commission right now. It's upon you now. All these nations that live by the sword that have come against you to destroy your identity, to take away everything, every ounce of power you have so that they could have dominion, to have the yoke be destroyed off of them that was placed on them from the blessing of Jacob. They need us now because their dominion their time of dominion is over. Their time of dominion is over. And the Most High said, He will punish them. So they see the punishment of the Most High being executed in the earth. And they know that He's coming for them. So they have to get into this truth. And they have to acknowledge the Most High as we do. So I give honor unto the Most High. And I give honor unto you great people. I love you. And I pray the best for you. 
And may the Most High continue to bless you and keep you. Shalom.